Joe Allen stays with us. He is the transhumanism editor for Bannon's War Room and the author of Dark Eon, Transhumanism and the War Against Humanity. Uh, Joe, where are we in terms of um, – I mean, this sort of gets back to the World Economic Forum because they're great supporters, it seems to me, uh, of a, um, a technocracy replacing uh, messy old democracy. and um, how AI uh, fits into the rise of technocracy. Um, and what is concerning to me is sort of the lack of transparency and accountability when everything is, you know, taken over by AI, the decision-making process. Um, you know, you can't call up your local MP in Canada or your local congressman and, and give them hell because it's been taken out of their hands. You know, I, what I see happening is a, a shift from what we would call technocracy, rule by experts, uh, by way of calculation and technique. Uh, and then you know, later, technocracy was conceived of as, as the same, but with the addition of technology, shifting into something more like an algocracy, the rule by algorithm, in which one's medical decisions, one's personal decisions, one's education – even democracy itself, uh, all of these are determined by algorithms as much or more so than human decisions, human agency. One of the concepts that Schwab toys with, he doesn't push hard, is that if you end up with an AI system that is able to predict what voters want, what a populace wants, what a populace needs, then at that point, democracy becomes somewhat redundant, right? You don't necessarily need people involved. Now, if you believe that the AI system or, or uh, you know, the set of AIs that are in charge of, of evaluating this and, and perhaps making these decisions, if you believe that that's superior, then it's really nothing to kick away the, the ladder, so to speak, of, of human agency of human will. But as human beings, uh, we, you know, we naturally recoil from such a situation, uh, or at least those who have any sense do. More and more so, it, it's, it's very unnerving. More and more so, people are seemingly uh, more ready to acquiesce to a system like that. Um, I, I can't tell you how many conversations I have with people in which they talk about how really the responsibility of these decisions uh, is, is a bit of a burden, and, and to alleviate it with uh, superior intelligence would be a, a, a relief. It would, it would just be you know, a, a, a form of freedom in and of itself, but it would be a freedom, a freedom from freedom. Uh, this, this, this concept of, of algocracy um, – it, it it seems, <clears throat> perhaps in my own description, sinister and nefarious, but the way it's billed, it's billed as human improvement. It's, it's billed as, as, as human augmentation. So uh, aside from you know, political decisions, you know, in which, the, the again, the, the needs of the public are met by uh, algorithms, the needs of the public are, are evaluated and, and, and met by calculation, you also have the issue of warfare. And in a recent interview with Lex Friedman, uh, we, we hear Mark Andreessen, the, the prominent venture capitalist who is in, uh, really bringing up a lot of these AI startups with his funding. He's talking about the future of warfare, and he's talking about how because human beings make terrible decisions in the fog of war, which is you know, to some extent obviously true – uh, the, the future of warfare should be purely algorithmic. He believes that the machines will be much better equipped to evaluate who is and isn't a legitimate target and be much better at making the decision to kill. This is happening simultaneously with the U.S. government, of course China, various governments around the world, building systems that can do exactly that, drones. Uh, various uh, uh, aquatic or marine uh, 
technologies, everything from like miniature submarines and 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 self uh, self steering torpedoes, um, land based uh, uh, technologies. So you have like basically a little remote control robots on wheels, but instead of being remote controlled, they control themselves. Uh, autonomous gun turrets, all of these. Uh, the the U.S. government and governments around the world are developing these systems with the intention, it seems of deploying them uh, in the near future. You have the replicator program at the DOD. They uh, plan to build or they're in the process of building many thousands of these these drones. You have Eric Schmidt, again, the co-author of the book The Age of AI, working with a company, Ishtari, to accelerate the development of these systems. And, of course, he chaired the uh, the uh, National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, in which they argue that the U.S. should be open to using autonomous systems in the future. It really is the height of algocracy when a machine is making the decision to kill. These life or death decisions, though, it, it, there's also a, a more mundane aspect to it. Autonomous vehicles, just self-driving cars, they are basically built to make life or death decisions. You have Elon Musk, you have Google, you have all these companies trying to build these things and implement them so that they become normalized, and, and they've done a pretty good job of it, actually. But in the end, what you end up with is yet another facet of human life in which human beings are held responsible for you know, the decisions they make, for the actions that they're taking, being swept away in favor of machines that are conceived of as superior. Uh, this is uh, more and more so going to be normalized, I believe, but not everywhere. I think that there'll be plenty of holdouts, plenty of uh, evolutionary backwaters, so to speak, at least in their terms. And I, I think that those are the places that will, in fact, be the centers of human flourishing, but they'll do so in the shadow of what will most likely also be the economically ascendant uh, areas of the world, and uh, the, the tension will just increase and rise uh, over time. I, I, I'm not really, I'm not in a position to say with any confidence who's going to win this this evolutionary struggle, at least in the short term. But I do believe that as human beings, as spiritual people, we're going to have to face it without any real concept or any assurance that we're going to win in the near term. I think that those people who want to reject this sort of technologized way of life uh, will have to do so with maybe that nagging suspicion that this generation, even the next generation, and even the, the one after uh, will suffer under something like um, what uh, Christians would call the tribulation. Hmm. Uh Coming back to the idea of AI-powered autonomous weapons uh, and taking the decision of using lethal force out of the hands of humans, um, doesn't that sort of sanitize the whole process of war and remove the the tremendous, um, you know, the, the the moral dilemma? Taking that out out of the equation might make the 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 decision to go to war too easy if you're not if you're not responsible knowingly responsible for the potential loss of innocent life civilian life if that's removed and taken away and now it's an algorithm no accountability no transparency um doesn't that make the decision to go to war too easy absolutely it does and it also – it may be a luxury position as, as someone who is not fighting in a war and is not enlisted to say this, but it also takes away the, the valor of war. It takes away the necessity of bravery. Um, you, you already have this with drones operated by soldiers who are in air-conditioned offices in Las Vegas. That's the classic sort of scene. And um, – it, it, you, you already have a situation in which much of warfare is detached from its its um, the, the grim realities of it. This is not true everywhere and for everyone. I mean, obviously, even right now in Israel 
and over the past uh, couple of years in, in Ukraine, a number of, of, of men and women have thrown themselves into conflict with their bodies and, and have lost their lives. So it's, it, we, we're not at a place now where fully autonomous warfare is upon us, but there are already those elements creeping in. And I, I do think that it, when you have a scenario in which machines are able to kill, where machines are in fact the, the combatants rather than human beings, you have, as you just mentioned, a situation in which it's that much easier to say, okay, we are going to attack our enemies because we don't have any uh, – the, the potential for the loss of life on our side has been reduced to almost nil. But you also have a situation in which the, um, the, 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 the sort of the, – the potential for a human being who's on the ground to make a moral decision that they are not willing to kill, for instance, like a, a civilian – or uh, just an enemy combatant who is perhaps n not necessarily worthy of, of death, uh, the, the moral component of warfare would, in that case, be eliminated, at least from the human realm. It would be pushed over to the machine. And so you don't have uh, anything like a conscientious objector when all warfare is mechanized. Um, do you have – maybe I'm being paranoid. I always – kind of assume uh, that when a new technology is released, it's been around, they've been holding on to it, they, <laughs> the ubiquitous they, but uh, it's been on a shelf waiting, 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 that in fact, the the technology is much further ahead and, uh, and it's kind of released in a drip, drip, drip fashion. In other words, it's probably 50 years beyond our our wildest imaginations. I think that was Ben Rich who said that at Skunk Works. Um, do you think that might be the same with AI? And if so, it, where are we uh, really? I mean, what what is truly out there? I mean, we think we have, you know, chat GPT-4. Um, who knows? Maybe they already have chat GPT-12. Well, you know, I encourage everyone to imagine every possible future or every possible present because the more people – who, who are imagining with full freedom uh, the more discoveries of actual realities we get. Uh, myself, though, I'm, I'm very cautious about this. I don't I, – I suspect that if, uh, the, for instance, if the DOD is 50 years ahead of where open AI is right now, then right now they have server farms somewhere buried beneath the earth that uh, no satellite system has detected – uh, which contains a super intelligent AI that basically knows everything that's happening in the digital system above ground. And uh, perhaps we have bases on the moon. Perhaps we have bases on Mars. I mean, 50 years ahead of where we're at now is full on, uh, you know, uh, end, end of 2001, a space odyssey territory. Uh, it's, it's, I, I think, again, it's, it's, it's great for people to – imagine or fantasize these things because it will, in fact, oftentimes lead to real discoveries. But uh, more than likely, I, I imagine it's more two or three years ahead of anything that we see now. And that even in that scenario, the rate of advancement means that 5, 10, 15 years on down the road, should we continue developing these technologies at this rate, um, we we will all you know we will be living in some sort of 2001 a space odyssey scenario. Except I don't think that that black monolith is necessarily pushing humanity towards something positive. I think it's pushing us towards something that's very deformed, something that's very perverse, something that is ultimately a kind of cultural mutation that, uh, in hindsight, will uh, be a horror. What um, I guess concerns me the most right now, one of the things that concerns me about AI and, you know, chat GPT-4 and so forth, uh, I'm thinking about like scams and, um, you know, we've all received those emails from ostensibly, uh, I guess they're, they're coming from places like Nigeria and some member of a, an ancient royal family needs to, you know, 
um, send us $12 million for safekeeping until he can escape from the country or something like that. He just needs our bank account number. Um, like, what do you see, what concerns you the most in terms of, you know, deep fakes and, and, and um, scams uh, and the technology falling into the wrong hands to perpetrate those, those scams? You know, as has been put uh, by others, we really have entered the collapse of reality. It's it's hard to say. At this point, I would have thought that deep fakes would be more rampant than they already are, and there have there is yet to be any major deep fake scandal in which, for instance, uh, some sort of government official is being made to say something that sparks off a war or even some sort of international crisis. That potential, though, is just sitting there, just simmering below the surface. The deep fake technology has come to the point where reasonably convincing images and videos of people uh, are, are easy to produce. And it's without being uh, too specific, it's impossible to imagine a world in the next two to three, certainly in the next five years, in which we don't end up in situations where someone has created you know, videos of uh, the, the current president of the U.S., whoever that is, or Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping, that um, are so frightening and incendiary that it does bring, you know, whip people into a panic. But you know, what we do have already – are uh, women who've had their images used for various kinds of pornographic deep fakes. And what we do have already are bots, the, the ability to create uh, language, uh, to train language models to scam people. And uh, it, it's not been super prevalent. Uh, again, I, I'm really surprised it hasn't been, and, and hopefully that holds out. But uh, in, the, in the example you just used, the Nigerian scams were pretty much uh, ubiquitous. You know, anybody with an email account has gotten one of those emails at some point or another. I, I suspect that in the next five years or so, it, it, you'll probably be getting messages from loved ones uh, begging for help, begging for you to yeah. send them money, whatever it may be. And Joe, I got to jump in here. Apologies for the interruption. We got to take a time out bottom of the hour. Uh, Irma Thomas taking us into the break. Anyone who knows what love is, back with more of my conversation with Joe Allen on AI and transhumanism and your calls right here on Coast to Coast AM. Joe Allen, author of Dark Eon, Transhumanism and the War Against Humanity and the transhumanism editor for Bannon's War Room. Uh, Joe, I was reading about this company. I think they're in China and they're offering clients uh, basically the ability to uh, communicate with dead relatives uh, what they do is, I guess, you you submit to the company any videos, photographs, audio recordings of your dearly departed grandmother or whomever, uh, and then they are able to uh, sort of reconstruct your relative and allowing you to have, I guess, I, I think it's two-way conversations. Um, it's a, like a digital necromancy. Um, have you heard of this, and what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, I've, I've written about this. I've actually uh, got a section uh, on this in my book. There are a lot of companies doing this. Uh, among the more disturbing, uh, Amazon uh, has proposed such a model. So you had um, Rahit Prasad, uh, chief uh, AI um, uh, a scientist for Amazon, presenting at the Mars conference about a year ago, uh, an exhibit of Alexa's forthcoming potential to replicate the voice of any person living or dead. And the example that he presented, it was a video of a young boy asking Alexa to read him a bedtime story in the voice of his dead grandmother. And there was a lot of talk of how, I believe uh, Prasad put it this way, that uh, I'm paraphrasing, but AI can't uh, eliminate the pain of loss, but it can alleviate it by preserving uh, the, the deceased's personality. Of course, Microsoft patented a system uh, not dissimilar to this, uh, which 
would train an AI on personalities, both living and dead. You have a number of AIs trained on historic figures, which is a kind of uh, necromancy. But then you have uh, companies, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the one you just mentioned in China, but there's another company in South Korea doing this. There are a number of American companies doing this. And at MIT, you have augmented eternity. Again, the, the idea is to create a digital replica of the dead, and they hope to commercialize it and, and sell it to uh, the average consumer. I, I don't know how widespread adoption will be, at least in this generation. But what's happening right now is that every one of us is leaving a, a very detailed digital footprint behind us. And in that footprint, you have all of these very personal, very intimate elements of your soul, right, of your, your psyche. And uh, the programs that you're talking about, the, 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 the idea of reconstructing uh, that digital footprint so that it is in some sense animate, so that it's in some sense alive, that's the, the basis of deep fakes. It's the basis of creating a kind of AI second self. And, of course, that will be the basis going forward for whomever adopts it of uh, creating uh, the kind of ghost or a race of those who um, were, were once with us. There's actually an organization called Terrorism. It's, uh, it's openly declared as a, a religion. Uh, it was founded by Martin Rothblatt, the transgender uh, founder of Sirius XM and now on the board of the Mayo Clinic. And uh, uh, Rothblatt's organization, Terrorism, uh, they engage in this as a spiritual practice. They call it mind filing in order to create a mind clone. And they see it as the forerunner to uploading uh, one's soul to the cloud. This in you know, transhumanist philosophy is, uh, in, in essence, a, a, a means of digital immortality. Again, it's, it's really hard to say how widespread the adoption will be, but the more digitized the culture is and the, the more traditional modes or traditional expectations of some sort of personal immortality after death are diminished, uh, I suspect that in the coming generations, uh, for some proportion of the population, this will be just absolutely normal. You will sit down to Thanksgiving dinner in some, at some point in the future, and dead grandma will be sitting there asking for you to pass the gravy. Wow. At this point, I'm hoping for an EMP event, I think, a Carrington event. That may be the only way out of this. <laughs> uh, let's say hello to first-time caller Eliza is in Wyoming. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM, Eliza. Okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. I had a question for Joe if he had ever read Dean Koontz's novels, because Dean Koontz is a visionary writer who points out the, the easy fall into immorality that these things uh, lead us to. And um, he's written a lot about it. Have Have you read Dean Koontz's books, Joe? Um, unfortunately, I am uh, very uh, ignorant of the world of fiction, although I will say that my good friend Kenneth Stevens, who uh, is completely immersed in fiction, and I, I get a lot of my um, uh, awareness of it from him, he has read Dean Koontz and has recommended it. And so... Uh, you and he could talk about this all night. Unfortunately, um, I, have, I have little or nothing to say about Dean Koontz, other than my impression is that he's much better than Stephen King. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> Thank you for that, Eliza. Uh, let's say hi to uh, Jim is in Delaware. Jim, welcome to Coast. Good morning. Morning, Richard. You did say you'd be back in November. <laughs> Here I am. Anyway, anyway my... My distant cousin was uh he had, he talks to his AI and his one of his computers. And uh one thing he asked the AI that would and that there wasn't a peep out of AI, he asked AI, Well the Antichrist control AI. 
and it wouldn't say anything. So he said it like that about five times, not a peep. Then he said, tried to say it in a different way, the same question about five more times. And it had not, no peek out of it at all. And uh, he says, my friend that was asking, or a relative, he said, that's scary. I said, that's scary. That's very telling from what I suspect. Great question, Jim. So, so Joe, I mean, is there any, any suggestion in the in the, the, the revelation that the Antichrist uh, might come uh, arise through artificial intelligence? Uh, there's a number of ways of looking at this, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you the most common, and that is uh, again in the 13th chapter, I believe, that you have the second beast in revelation constructing an image of the first beast the antichrist uh and it is you know said in the bible that the the image of the beast will speak and that all will kneel to it or submit to it i i think that again is an artistic motif or as a poetic motif uh, it sure does fit awfully closely it's also you know, many people who talk about demons uh, or even anthroposophists who talk about aramonic forces, this sort of calculating spirits, um, they, they talk about this desire on behalf of these uh, disincarnate beings to be embodied, and that uh, the idea is that they are manipulating human beings into creating a body for them in the form of technology in the form of robots or in the kind of also semi-disincarnate form of uh, artificial intelligence as a as a poetic way of viewing the technology or uh, in a poetic interpretation of the sacred scriptures I, I i think that it aligns closely enough that uh, it, it keeps me up at night uh me too me too uh thanks for the call jim carl's in boston carl welcome to coast Hi, Richard. Uh, Hi there. Back. Thank you for taking Thank my you. call. And Joe, it's kind of along the lines of what the last caller said, but it's a little bit different. Do you think that Social Security numbers, and to be more, uh, Don of the wonderful call screen is going to kill me, but specificity? No, that's not right. Specificity? No, I can't say it. I'm sorry, but you know what I'm <laughs> trying to say. To be more specific, uh, on the mark of the beast, uh, um, do you think that the social security numbers and like our bank account numbers and things like that and digital fingerprint IPs and now like at Whole Foods and Amazon going for the hand, the handprint is all warming us up for either a tattoo, you know, get us used to, um, you know, being more comfortable with letting our stuff out there in the digital world. And then, or is is that, I think I heard you say more specifically that basically putting your handprint on a screen is in a way Mark of the Beast. And that's my only question. Thank you, sir. All right, Carl, thank you for that. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, again, in the 13th chapter, it says that uh, humankind will have a, a mark on the right hand or the forehead in ancient Rome, uh, slaves would have a brand on the forehead. Uh, soldiers would have a brand on the hand. As, as you move on down to the modern era, people have talked about Social Security numbers being the mark of the beast. Uh, people have talked about uh, barcodes as being uh, the mark of the beast. But uh, you know, as we progress into an era in which every hand – has a smartphone in it, and perhaps in the near future, every head will have an augmented reality set on it. And if you keep going into the future in which you have perhaps a microchip in every hand and a brain-computer interface uh, in every head, all of these technologies seem to fit fairly seamlessly into that poetic motif and uh, it, it, to me, it doesn't necessarily matter if it is a social security number or if it is an RFID chip uh, or a, a full-on Neuralink brain-computer interface. Um, all of them describe a system 
in which the entire world is subjugated by a universal power, and all human beings are, in essence, under the reign of quantity, under the reign of the number. Um, that I, it, we should listen carefully to those ancient voices and take their visions very seriously. Uh, I'll try to squeeze in at least one more here. West of the Rockies, Tom, Tom is in Riverside, California. Tom, welcome to Coast. Hello, Richard. Hello, Joe. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's just a matter of uh, of the laws and the society moving in the direction where technology augments uh, the ability of man. And uh, just an example, the cars, they're trying to make cars drive themselves, which is bound. You know, if you're around machinery, I'm a maintenance mechanic, have been my whole whole life. Uh, Something's going to go wrong with the machine sooner or later. You know, something's going to happen. So uh, people are going to get killed. Things are going to happen. Tragedy is going to happen. And all you have to really do is just be sensible about it. I'm not going to try to predict what God's going to do. God has his plan, and he knows what his part is. We got to figure out what our part is to his plan on this earth. Uh, But as far as our part right now, I think we need to use some common sense and apply the technology to uh, automobiles, for instance, and everything else and not try to put it in charge. It seems like there's a push to make it do everything and think for us. Why don't we just do some thinking for ourselves and use that computer and use the calculator to do some uh, calculations, but not give it the whole job? That, that's great. Uh, it's simple. Great. great call, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Joe, did you want to respond to that? Well, you know, ultimately, we are all creatures of the modern world, and uh, all of us are in some way going to be augmented by the technologies that we use. So, uh, you know, a kind of binary black and white, I do or don't use technology is impossible. So it really is, you know, as the caller said, it's going to be down to the decisions that each person makes, each community makes, and uh, we're going to be faced with some uh, pretty daunting decisions going forward. We already are. Uh, To me, the more suspicion is cast on the system, the more people are going to be spared or at least not ensnared uh, by that system. But um, as far as dropping out completely, well, the, the Amish are pretty welcoming, but they're also pretty strict. So uh, that's a huge leap to take. (laughs) Joe, thank you so much for this. Dark Eon, Transhumanism and the War Against Humanity. How do we get a copy? Uh, You can get it at the publisher's website, skyhorsepublishing.com. You can get it on Canonic XYZ, that's C-A-N-O-N-I-C dot XYZ, Bitcoin only. And of course, if you are acculturated to the great beast, you can get it on Amazon. I urge you to give it a good review because the beast likes good reviews. Joe, thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Richard. All right. When we come back, open lines. Here's Duffy taking us into the break and Mercy on Coast to Coast AM. <laughs> 